In this chapter, we're going to be introducing logic and proofs. In this lesson, we're going to look at equivalence proofs. All right, hi everybody. So in this lesson here, we are going to take a look at equivalence proofs. Okay, so now, like it says here, we're going to consider proofs related to solving equations or establishing identities. Okay, so equations or identities. And these require that we understand some of the properties of equivalence. Okay, in other words, what can we do if we know that that the two sides of this expression are equal to each other? Now, a lot of those properties are, are listed below, and we'll kind of scan through those. Um, and in tabular proofs, and the ones that are going to follow here, the ones that we're going to use here, the rules are referenced very specifically. Okay, we are going to identify what the rules are very specifically. Although, like it says right here, and I really appreciate this comment here, most of the time, these properties are, are, are used without any reference at all. We get very comfortable with these. We understand these quite intimately by the time we're, we're well through uh, high school. And so we apply them without reference. We don't even think about it. Um, what's nice about this little section right here is we are going to take a moment to, to reference them. And I hope that this kind of helps you as you're working through even solving some equations that you're already quite familiar with to understand why we do certain things instead of having it just be this automatic uh, kind of reflex. I see a certain structure, I do this. I see a certain structure, I do this. Okay, but this gives you some understanding as to why we, we can do the things that we do. So I, I like this, this time that we get to spend here with this. Um, again, you're, it, this is not going to change the way you solve equations. Um, you're still going to to do them the way you've done it before here, but this might give you a better understanding as as to what things uh, work the way they do. So here's some properties just to, to uh, start off with. The associative property okay, is about kind of grouping there. Uh, if you've got um, a list of addition, if I can I can group together those those first two terms, or I can group together those last two terms here. Um, doesn't change anything. It stays equal. Same thing with multiplication. Okay, uh, I can group those how you want. And the result stays the same here. Uh, addition and multiplication are both commutative. If you can change the order, okay, and the order doesn't change the, the answer there. Uh, we've got these things called identities. There's the uh, additive identity, which is zero. So if I add zero to a number, that doesn't change the identity of that number. It stays the same here. So we call that the additive identities. A plus zero is the same as zero plus A. The answer is A. The multiplicative identity is one. You multiply a number by one, you get that number. One multiplied by that number is that number. It's, it keeps its identity, okay? Uh, there are inverses. The additive inverse is simply the, the negative of that number here so that when you combine the two, A and negative A together, it produces the identity, the additive identity. And again, because addition is commutative, order doesn't matter there. With multiplication, the multiplicative identity, i uh, sorry, the multiplicative inverse is going to be 1 over, the expression 1 over that value. So A multiplied by 1 over A is 1. You, you get the identity back out. And again, because multiplication is commutative, order doesn't matter. Uh, there is one little stipulation here. We can't let A go to 0 because remember that, that leads to an undefined value here in and we don't want to we don't want to kind of get caught up in that for the time being. The distributive property here, okay, a multiplication distributes over uh, addition. Okay, so a multiplied by b plus c multiplies through. Uh, and although this isn't, it's not quite the same thing. Like when I put it underneath the multiplication table here, but we can go backwards with that as well. If I've got a plus b, sorry, a times b plus a times c. I can factor out the A here. So this is this is like you're factoring. We're creating a, a multiplication. This is like taking multiplication and creating the addition there, like the distribution and then the factor. Uh, then we've got properties of equality and, and inequalities. I've included that as well here. Okay. So some things just to, to, to talk about here. The multiplicative property of zero, if you multiply something by zero or zero by something, you get zero. Okay. A zero product. If you've got, oops, if you've got two factors multiplied together and the result is zero, then I know that one of those values is zero. Either A is zero or B is zero. One of them is going to be zero. Uh, the reflexive property here, A is equal to A. 
which seems kind of obvious here, but there actually are some uh, some times where stating that um, is actually important for the flow of a, of a proof. Uh, symmetry. If A is equal to B, then B is equal to A, right? It doesn't really matter what side of the equation you write that on. Now, the transitive property. If A is equal to B and B is equal to C, then A is equal to C. And then we've got some, um, of some versions of that that uh, reflect what happens with the inequalities. If A is greater than B, as B is greater than C, then A must be greater than C. You just, it's like lining them up on a number line, okay? Uh, and you'll see that that's how that works there. Uh, addition. And here's something that we use all the time. If you've got an equality and you add C to one side, it's the same as adding C to the other side. By adding C to both sides, you maintain equality here. Uh, notice that the same thing happens with the inequality. The direction of the inequality does not change by adding a constant to both sides. And if that works for addition, it works, it works just as well for subtraction there. Uh, multiplication. Multiplication is a little bit more complicated. So if I've got an expression of equality and I multiply both sides by a constant, okay, that maintains the equality. That's The equality is not the problem. The equivalence is not the problem. It's the inequality that's the issue here. Because when you multiply by a negative, it changes the direction of the sign. So if you multiply by a positive where C is greater than zero, that sign, that in this case, in this first one, it's less than, it stays less than. But if C is less than zero, if it's a negative, then we see that that changes uh, direction there. Okay? Same thing here. If A is greater than B and C is positive, not a problem. But if C is negative, it changes the direction of the sign. So just, just remember, multiplication, or, and we're going to see just a moment here, division by a negative make, makes a bit of a difference here. Uh, and again, there are division. If A is equal to B, we're assuming that, then I can divide both sides by C, assuming, of course, that C isn't, isn't equal to zero. And then we get a similar sort of thing here. If C is less than zero, as it is in both of these cases here, it changes the direction of the inequality. And finally down here, if A is equal to B, then if we raise both sides uh, to the same power, that will maintain equality, okay? And if we've got an inequality here, okay, uh, bearing in mind here that if, if n is greater than zero, okay, and, and this becomes uh, important here, um, if n is greater than zero, then the, the direction of the equality or the, um, the inequality stays the same here. But if n is less than zero, it changes the direction of the sign. Now, the reason for that is, okay, and we'll just do a really, really quick example here. Um, let's say that we've got um, uh, two is less than three, and I'm going to let n equal negative one. Well, two to the negative one, three to the negative one, I want you to think about that. These become rationals. This is like one half, and this is like one third. And as soon as you do that, the direction of the inequality changes. One half is larger than one third. Okay? So it, we're seeing this the, the direction of the sign change. It's not for the same reason um, as it is up here. Up here is because the negative is um, switching the, the value. Uh, down here is because we're creating we're creating um, rationals. And remember, the larger the denominator, the smaller the, the value of the rational. And then finally, we've got substitution. Okay, if you've got A equal to B, then you can substitute. B can be substituted anytime you see A in an expression. Okay, and it, probably by the time you're in high school here, you've done that so much, you're very, very familiar with that idea of substitution here. Now, in a proof, okay, what we're going to do here, particularly in like a tabular proof, which is what you're going to see a lot of now, we're going to make these incremental steps towards a conclusion. So just line by line, we're going to get closer and closer to the, the conclusion that we're, we're working towards here. But with every step, we are explicit with the reason why each step is justifiable. Now, we don't often do that, but in a tabular proof, we, we do here. So what we're doing is we're, we're making statements. We're, we're establishing a starting point, and we're moving to the next step here. Then we're moving to the next step. But then we give reasons why we are allowed to do that. So we're justifying each of our, our moves. Now, if you've never really worked with a tabular proof before, you, you got to kind of see one work um, in, in, we'll do that in just a few moments here. Uh, but before we get to that, just one, uh, one last little thing here. 
any time that a statement is accepted as true without without requiring justification. Okay, um, so and that might happen if we're we're starting a problem and we just give you some information to work with. Well, if if it's given to you, we're going to say that it's given, and therefore you can just accept it as true. Okay, so that is going to be accepted as true. We're not going to need to prove it. We're not going to need to justify why it's true. It was given to us. It's going to be accepted as true. Okay, so with all of that in mind here, we're going to take a look at some, some proofs. I'm going to say quote-unquote proofs here. Uh, really what you're going to see for the first little bit here is you're going to see a couple of equations being solved, mostly. It's mostly going to be equations being solved, and we're going to justify the, the solution, okay? Okay. Um, and hopefully it's going to give you a sense of why we do the things that we do when we solve an equation. Okay, we're just going to look at it as a proof as opposed to solving an equation here. And um, I think it's kind of an enlightening experience, quite honestly. I, I hope that it it uh, offers some clarity where you might have been confused by some steps. We'll take a look here just a moment. Okay, so this one here says, prove that the solution to the equation 3x minus 2 equals 7 is x equals 3. Now, I know, I know, you you have done these sorts of things before. You understand how this works. And you don't normally think of this as something that you have to prove. is more than something you have to solve here. But we want to just walk through what's going on and, and why you can do it here. So here's how this would look uh, as, a, as a tabular proof here. So first of all, we're going to take the statement. Okay, whoops. We're going to take our statement here that 3x minus 2 is equal to 7. And that is given to us. Okay, so that's where that given is coming from, from here. So we start with that. Now, we know because of the addition property of equality that if we add 2 to both sides of the equation, the equa the equality remains okay i haven't changed anything the left side remains equal to the right side as long as they do it to both sides here so 3x minus 2 plus 2 is just 3x 7 plus 2 is 9. and and notice that what happens here is i give the reason after telling you what it does for me in the next step I get that x is equal to 3 and what i've done is i've, I've applied the division property of equality so as long as I'm not dividing by zero, I can divide both sides of the equation by the same value, in this case, three, and the equality remains. And I, I get here this x is equal to three, which is what I was trying to show in the first place, okay, that x minus three. So that's what the QED tells me. I'm done. I was trying to show that the solution to this equation was x equals three, and I showed it, okay? And there we go. That's so. That's that's one way you might go about looking at uh, at these kind of, of proofs here. So I'm hoping that that little bit of familiarity helps give a little bit of clarity to how this sort of thinking works. Let's take a look at some more examples. Okay. So this question here says prove by filling in the gaps. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to just pull out a couple of lines and and we're going to pr uh, provide those. We're going to prove that the solution to x squared plus 5x plus 6 equals 0 is going to be negative 3 and negative 2. Okay, and you can see we've got three lines that we've got to fill in here. Okay, so now I'm just going to slide this up just a little bit. Okay, so we start off with what we're given, which is that equation there, that x squared plus 5x plus 6 is equal to 0. That's given to me. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to... I'm going to rewrite 5x as 2x plus 3x. Now, this isn't so much a, a property of the equation. This isn't an equivalence property so much as this is just a statement of arithmetic. Okay? 2x plus 3x is 5x. Now, you might wonder, well, why did I choose that? Why did I choose the 2 and the 3? And this goes back to to work that you would have done with, with factoring. And I hope that rings a bell here. What I'm looking for here is I'm looking for two numbers whose product is six and whose sum is five. So that would be something that at this point you would be probably quite familiar with this, this whole factoring thing. So what I'm doing is I'm rewriting five as two X plus three X. 
then what we're going to do here is we're going to apply association. Okay. By introducing those parentheses here, I'm now associating these two terms with each other and these two terms with each other. And remember, I can do that. You can totally do that. There's not a problem there. Okay. This, this expression is equal to this expression. The association there has done nothing. Then what I do is I'm going to take advantage of the distributive property. Now, remember, there were two versions of the distributive property. One was like an expansive thing. The other one was a factoring thing. It was like a, a simplifying thing here. So I'm taking advantage of the factoring uh, part here. There is a common X to the first two terms here. So I take I take it out. I write it as a, as a factor out front. And in the second uh, set of uh, brackets there, there's a common factor of three. Well, that's the distributive property. It's just the, the, the kind of the backwards of the distributive property. And what I notice here is that now I've got this x plus 2 factor that is common to these two, sorry, to, to these two factors here. Or sorry, I shouldn't say factors. At this point here, they're not factors anymore uh, because I've got this addition in between them. They're, they're add-ends, okay? So what I've got here is I've got this x plus 2 that's common to both here. So what we do here is we're going to apply the distributive property. The distribute, whoops, the distributive property again, but this time, again with factoring, but this time we're going to take out that common factor of x plus 2. That can be difficult for people because of that binomial there, okay? Seeing that binomial is common, sometimes that's, that's not easy to do. But remember, those parentheses there, those brackets hold that together as one unit. Now, the zero product property... Okay, bear in mind, this whole time here, this has been equal to zero, equal to zero, equal to zero, equal to zero, equal to zero. So now the two, if I've got two factors multiplied together and the result is zero, I know that either the first factor is zero or the second factor is zero. I'm not entirely sure which one it is. Okay, so it could be either here. And so now I'm going to apply the subtraction property, okay, the subtraction property of equivalence, oops, of equivalence, and I'm going to subtract two, or and then subtract three from both sides of the equation here. So subtract two, subtract two, subtract three, subtract three, and that gets me that the answers here are negative two and negative three. That that little v symbol there, that is an and, okay. And if you're if you're not familiar with that, that symbolar means and. There are actually a, a a couple of symbols. Oh, I should say and. Sorry, I should say or. Oh, wow. I can't believe I did that. That was that was bad. That is not and. Sorry, that is or. So the solution could be come from x plus 2 equals 0 or x plus 3 equals 0. Okay? So my answer is either going to be x equals negative 2 or x equals negative 3. And there we go. We're done. We've been able to show that the solutions to the equations Okay, it could be um, either negative 2 or negative 3. So now in this question here, we're asked to prove that 3x minus 2 divided by x plus 5 is equal to 2 sevenths has the solution x equals 24 over 19. And we're going to fill in the gaps just like we did in the previous and we're going to fill in some of the missing ones here. So to start off with, we've got uh, the given, okay, the statement of the equation here. That's our given. So we're told that 3x minus 2 over x plus 5 is equivalent to or equal to 2 sevenths. Okay, well, the first thing that we might do here is apply the multiplication property of equality. Basically, we're going to multiply both sides of that equation by x plus seven, sorry, x plus five times seven, x plus five multiplied by seven. We've multiplied both sides of the equation by the exact same thing. Now, so although I can do that, that doesn't necessarily explain why I'm choosing to do that. This is kind of where your experience in solving is important here. Just like in that previous question there where breaking that 5x into 2x plus 3x, like right now I'm justifying why I can do that. But what I'm not really explaining is why did I do that? Okay, like what, what was it that motivated me to, to do that specific step here? So like what is it that motivates me to multiply by x plus 5 times 7? Well, that's because I'm getting, I'm multiplying both sides of the equation by the denominator. But that's not, that's not really our, our point right now. Our point here isn't to explain why we're, we're choosing those particular numbers. It's 
it's to justify that that step why that works or why I'm allowed to do it. And that is the multiplication property of, e of equality. Now, I look at my next step here. It says division. Well, okay, what do I mean by division here? Well, clearly I'm going to be uh, applying that operation. On the left-hand side, when I divide x plus 5 by x plus 5, I get a 1. Okay, and so that is going to end up giving me 3x minus 2. And then there's that 7 there. On the right-hand side, the 7s will cancel. 7 divided by 7 is 1, and I'm left with 2 times x plus 5. Now, I'm going to throw a little comma in here because something has happened, and we want to make sure that we identify this. Remember that there was an issue with division, okay? I, I can't divide by 0. Now, you might look at this and say, well, I, I, I didn't divide by 0. Well, I divided by an x plus 5. And if x is negative 5, then I did divide by 0. So basically, I'm just going to state here, just, just to make sure that doesn't happen, I'm going to include this little statement here, x cannot equal negative 5. And you'll notice a couple steps down, that shows up again. Okay? So now, we, we've done that. So now the next step here says distribution. Okay, when I look at the work in the previous step here, well, what are we talking about distribution here? Well... It seems pretty clear that what we're doing on the left-hand side is taking that negative 7 and distributing it through to get 21x minus 14. And I can do the same thing on the right-hand side and distribute the 2 through to get 2x plus 10. But remember, that's so long as x does not equal negative 5. Do I still need to write that x can't equal negative 5? Yes. Yes, until I know for sure that that's no longer necessary, i got to keep writing it. Now, my next step seems to be done for me completely. Let's just make sure that it makes sense with what I've done here. It says the subtraction property of equality. So it looks like I'm subtracting the same thing from both sides here. And when I look at my step here, yeah, it looks like what I did is I subtracted 2x from both sides to get 19x minus 14 is equal to 10, where x can't equal 5. Okay, well this is good, this is looking good here. So now the next thing that I'm going to do is I want to get, remember, the goal of solving here is to get that, that term with the x in it by itself. So basically I want to get rid of that minus 14, so I'm going to add 14 and I'm going to add it to both sides here. So I know that this is going to be the addition property the addition property of equality. And if I add 14 to both sides, I'm going to get 19x is equal to 24. And again, with the little statement here that x cannot equal negative 5. And then I'm going to divide both sides of the equation by the same thing. I can see that in my next step here. It says division property of equality. I'm Because I'm trying to get x by itself, I'm going to divide by 19. And so, I, again, I'm going to say this again because I want to make sure that our goal is clear here. I'm not justifying why I'm dividing by 19. What I'm trying to do here is just make sure that you understand that we are allowed to divide by the same thing on both sides, and I justified that step. I mean, I could have divided by 18 on both sides, but that really wouldn't have helped me move towards my goal. I could still justify it. So what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to trying to choose steps wisely so that I'm moving towards my goal. But really the purpose of this is to get you used to this idea of justifying each of those steps here. Now, I've got now that x is equal to 24 over 19. I, now that is about as simple as that's going to get because uh, 24 and 19 don't share any common factors. Do I need to include the, step, uh, the statement now that x does not equal negative 5? Well, no. No, I don't. And the reason I don't is because I just said x is equal to 24 over 19. It's not negative 5. Okay, I'm done. Q, E, D. That's what I wanted to show. I wanted to show that the answer was 24 over 19. I did. Now, let's take a look at another one here where we're going to be given a lot more freedom um, as to how to work through it. So this question says, prove that x squared plus 6x plus 9 over x plus 3 equal to 0. That equation has no solutions. Okay, okay, so we're going to jump into this here. Now, uh, I've given you uh, a lot of lines here. You're, we're probably not going to need them all. 
Um, I just threw those down there because the, the intention of this is that this would be something that you might do on your own and then talk with your, with your teacher about it sort of thing. So remember the video here is just kind of uh, extra support for, for stuff like this. So let's take a quick look at this. Uh, we're not given a lot other than just that statement there. There's no solutions here. Now, a colleague of mine uh, had gone through and done this particular um, proof here. And then I've done this one as well here. And, and we both did this in, in very different ways here. Uh, and it turns out it doesn't really matter. We both kind of came around uh, to the same conclusion. And it was it was just interesting that that there is a little bit of freedom there to approach this in, in multiple different ways. So let me show you what, what I did here. Um, the very first thing that I did was to do addition. Whoops, I keep forgetting that. I did addition here. Now, what she did was multiplication. She multiplied both sides by that x plus 3, and, and that's, that's fine here. What I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to take a moment here, and I'm going to take that x squared, and I'm going to rewrite that 6x as 3x and 3x plus 9 over x plus 3. Okay, So I hope you're, you're seeing what I'm doing there. Okay, and this is equal to zero. Okay, so am I allowed to do that? Am I allowed to kind of split that six up into into three x plus three x? Yes, I am. I can justify that. There's there's no problem with that. I have applied the operation of addition properly. Uh, you know, granted, in the opposite direction here. Like I'm, I'm not adding them together to get six. I'm showing them that six is equal to those two added together. The the exact reason why I chose to write it as 3x and 3x as opposed to, let's say, 2x and 4x, well, okay, that may be not explained here. That's a, a factoring move. My reason for doing it this way is, is inspired by what I know about factoring. But again, I'm just justifying the fact that that step there can be done. The next thing that I'm going to do here is I'm going to put parentheses or brackets around those first two terms and around the last two terms in the numerator. This is all over x plus 3 equal to 0. Can I do that? Yes, I can. That is just association. Okay, that is the associative property there. Next, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take out an x out of the first two terms, and then I'm going to take out a 3 out of the next two terms. That's all over x plus 3. This is still all equal to 0. Now, can I do that? And yes, I can. That is the distributive property. And yep, that's totally allowed. Now, when I take a quick look at that, I notice that in the two terms in the numerator, I've got an x plus 3 here and an x plus 3 here. Well, I can apply the distributive property again to get x plus 3 multiplied by x plus 3 all over, oh, and I got a lot going on here, x plus 3 is equal to 0. And that is, once again, the distributive property. And I'll, again, I'll say it right here. This is not the only way to answer this problem or to even approach this proof. Okay, We could have done this a different way here, and that would have been fine. Now, I hope you're seeing uh, the same thing I am that that x plus 3 divided by x plus 3 is equal to 1. Now, that is that is the inverse. And if, if you want, we might want to put in brackets here, that is the multiplicative inverse. When I multiply x plus 3, or sorry, did take x plus 3 and divide it by x plus 3, I get 1. So this is like saying 1 multiplied by x plus 3 is equal to 0. Then, and now, by the way, once I do that, once I've uh, canceled that, I really do need to point out here, because there is an issue here, that x can't be equal to negative 3. x cannot be equal to negative 3. And now I'm, I'm kind of done with that, because look at where it picks up here. At the bottom, x minus 3, so sure, x is equal to minus 3, I should say here. What they did is they, they applied the subtraction property of equality to that, but we still got this x cannot equal negative 3 there. So... That step is telling me x is equal to negative 3, but x cannot equal negative 3. So there is, therefore, no solution. And the reason for that is there's a contradiction. Okay? 
we've got contradictory statements here. There's no solution. And so there is the end of my proof. Okay, well, so I hope I hope this kind of helps out here a little bit. Um, like I said, this is all sort of work that you are already familiar with. Uh, we're just kind of going back over uh, rules that you would have looked at a long time ago and trying to remind you of them um, to give you a sense of how, how proofs works, the structure of proofs works. So we're using something that you're very familiar with to maybe introduce a new way of, of thinking about these mathematical expressions. Additionally, and, and quite honestly, uh, if you look closely at the the uh, properties of equality here, or the, the um, what do we call those things? We call those, yeah, the properties of equality. Uh, you're likely to see a few things there that you may have maybe misremembered or even forgotten existed uh, that might make some of your, your work a little bit easier to do. Anyway, I hope that helps.